Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rula Deep. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntech Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTOP and ESCCP. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's event. The webinar focuses on DOD-funded research efforts to advance additive manufacturing processes for the reuse of waste materials at forward operating bases and depots. First, Dr. Paul Allison from the University of Alabama will discuss an experimental and computational approach to solid state additive manufacturing of metal waste. Paul's presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. Then, Dr. Prabhat Swami from EMC2 will talk about the conversion of thermoplastic materials to useful products. Prabhat's presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session featuring both of today's speakers. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not uh, yet done so, uh, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you're unable to download Zoom, you can view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you continue to have difficulties or if your screen freezes, try keying in Control and F5, and that will allow you to do a hard refresh of your screen. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select the speaker and microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to have difficulties, just call into the conference line shown here. You may also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be used for questions for the speakers. And in case of continued difficulties, uh, you can download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email that will allow you to follow along with the slides uh, via audio only. Note that we will be live streaming the webinar on the CERTUP and ESCCP YouTube channel, so that's another option to follow today's proceedings. The webinar will be listen only. You can submit questions by using the Q&A button on your control bar. Uh, when you do submit questions, please add your organization na name at the end of the question so that we can identify it. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Kurt Preston, who is the Startup and ESCCP Program Manager for Research Resource Conservation and Resiliency. Dr. Preston has tracked his career between civilian university and military positions. Prior to his current position with CERDAP and ESCCP, he was a faculty member and research administrator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he led faculty development efforts to improve research competitiveness. In this position, Kurt also worked with technology transfer personnel, academic departments, and colleges to build university research capability. In addition, he has served as a member of Chief of the Army Corps of Engineers Environmental Advisory Board. Kurt, please proceed. Hi, thank you, Rula. I am happy to welcome everyone to today's CERTUP and ESTCP webinar. CERTUP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTUP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on Department of Defense requirements. CERTUP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impact real world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. 
in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the laboratory and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERTIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are several environmental drivers for the type of work funded by CERTIP and ESTCP with the underlying objective of sustaining Department of Defense ranges, facilities, and operations. This, as you can imagine, is a broad undertaking. It takes the form of looking at maritime sustainability, threatened and endangered species, climate impacts, unexploded ordnance and munitions constituents, as well as other environmental drivers. One key environmental driver is the reduction of current and future environmental liabilities. This involves addressing contamination from past practices, including impacts to groundwater, soil, and sediment, unexploded ordnance contamination, and developing management approaches for contaminants of emerging concern. The second part of this is pollution prevention with a focus on eliminating likely environmental pollutants or hazardous materials in manufacturing, maintenance, and operations on our installations. We have several main focus areas for research and demonstration at CERTIP and ESTCP as shown here. Technology transfer is very important within the CERTIP and ESTCP programs and includes the developments of videos, training workshops, and guidance documents. The webinar series is a substantial component of our technology transfer efforts. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts across all of our program areas. Upcoming topics include predictive and modeling tools for improved assessments of PFAS environmental risk, natural resource management through unmanned aircraft system technology, demonstration and validation of new non-invasive technologies to assess contaminant storage in low permeability media and rock matrices, and others. The next WP webinar is on June 16th and it'll be on corrosion, mitigation, and predictive analysis for Department of Defense weapon systems. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link. All past webinars are archived and can be assessed using this link. Finally, I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our webinar webpage. We would appreciate it if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of this webcast. I certainly hope you enjoy today's webinar. Thank you so much, Kurt. It is now my pleasure to introduce our fourth, the first speaker, Dr. Paul Allison, who is the director of the Manufacturing at the Point of Need Center at the University of Alabama, uh, where he also serves as an associate professor in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, Dr. Allison is pioneering computational and experimental research on solid state advanced manufacturing processes, and he is involved in developing a fundamental understanding of the processing structure property performance um, relations for a variety of material systems to support both basic and applied research projects with both industrial and federal sponsors. 
Uh, Paul has co-authored over 100 journal articles, book chapters, technical reports, and conference papers, and is active on multiple technical com committees. And he received his doctoral degree in mechanical engineering from Mississippi State University. Paul, we're delighted to have you with us today. Please proceed. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I'm really excited to be here. And one thing I want to say is this is a collaborative effort with our, our our former students, uh, like Taylor Mason, who's now at Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, George Stubblefield, who's at, at Erdic, uh, Brandon Phillips, who's, who's at uh, AVMC, uh, Dustin Avery, who's at uh, uh, Navsi Carterock, uh, and Sadie Beck, who, who went back and, and is now a professor at West Alabama, as well as our collaborators at, at Army Research Lab, Kevin Doherty, really helping us understand some fundamental work. And then even uh, Dr. Tim Rushing, who, who's really got involved as, as we've looked at subcomponents at, at Army Erdic. And then my two colleagues here at, at the University of Alabama, uh, Dr. Luke Brewer and, and Dr. Brian Jordan. So in today's talk, perfect. So in today's talk, you know, I really wanna talk about sort of this background and need for, for low power, sustainable ways that we, we can reuse waste materials. And as we do that, we'll talk about our motivation for the approach we've, we've discussed here, really a solid state approach and, and why we chose that. And then we'll go into, you know, how are we doing this approach and, and how can it be trans transitioned to, to forward operating bases or, or even depots? Uh, and, and then, you know, as we do this, I think it's important to really understand sort of what does this microstructure mechanical behavior look like as, as we compare maybe new virgin feedstock to the secondary feedstocks that come from, from a variety of waste streams. And then finally, you know, I think it's really helpful to see some examples of, of what we've done. And so this is actually some, some aluminum airfield matting that we've been able to repair in collaboration with our, our colleagues at, at Army Erdic. And then I'll wrap up and talk about, you know, what, what, are, what does this work mean and, and how, can, how can we really benefit the, the, the nation and the warfighter with this work? So, in this, this program, we were really tasked with how can we, we use secondary feedstocks, so waste streams, battle damage equipment, uh, machining waste, to repair or even manufacture new uh, components in austere environments. And so we really tackled that by, by how can we you know, propose this, this paradigm shift in, in additive manufacturing and repair with, with a, a minimal logistical footprint and, and quoting our, our colleague, Mark Pepe at ARL, you know, really manufacturing at the point of need. And so to do this, you know, we really have involved a, a, a technical approach that really looks at, at how does the, the processing of these materials influence that, that microstructure that evolves as we process it. Uh, we, we impart thermal cycles, uh, just like with, with traditional and uh, additive manufacturing people are used to. And how does that microstructure evolve and, and what are the properties we get out of these different feedstocks? And as we do that, then we're able to understand and, and calibrate some, some uh, multi-scale modeling work. And so I'm specifically gonna talk about that next as we do this and, and really look at, you know, how can we use our, our, our smooth particle hydrodynamics modeling of the process? And, and this has been really great to, to even tag uh, particles where, where we can look at oxides or discrete strips of materials and not just monolithic feedstocks and really understand, you know, what are those local plastic strains uh, and, and temperatures that, that we get up to during processing. We get into that, that layer by layer and those, those different heat inputs or maybe how do we need to control the process by, by changing our parameters and how does that microstructure evolve and coupling that with, you know, microstructure based uh, multi-stage fatigue models and internal state variable plastic damage models to really capture that, that uh, both uh, monotonic and, and cyclic behavior so we can understand how our, our components behave. And so as we do that, you know, there's, there's really a need to, to maybe use what we have and really be more sustainable. And that's, that's really where, where I think this call came out from. And so it's, it's, you know, how can we, we save energy by reducing logistic tails? Uh, and, and this is beneficial for many reasons. You know, there's, there's risk with free supply convoys. Uh, energy is a challenge. Uh, you know, what, what is our material we're using as our feedstock? You know, there's, there's challenges with powders. Uh, and we know that there's, there's, uh, there's 
waste streams that we can use and, and maybe we don't want to turn into powders. And so can we do a direct additive recycling approach as we, you know, maybe look at unserviceable equipment or battle damage equipment and, and use the, the, the maintenance moss uh, units to, to generate uh, this, this, this feedstock material from, from their, their secondary waste streams. And so that's really what we've been doing. And, and I think this slide here where we look at, you know, why do we not want to have powders at, at a forward operating base or, or even in a steer environment? And, and so really, you know, this is where, where we looked at, hey, can we, can we just take those machine ships and directly use them? Or can we just cut our material up from larger components and turn it right into our feedstock and, and not go through the energy it takes to, to take a, a solid material, melt it down, atomize it, turn it into powder, and then have to, to you know, control that size and distribution powders. But, but let's just use what we have as, as, as best we can. And so that's really what we've been focusing on. And so the approach we've taken is, is a solid state uh, additive friction step, stir deposition process. And so the schematic on the left kind of shows how we, we push a, a feedstock through our tool and we'll raise that tool up and that'll give us our layer height. And so some of this work has even explored, you know, how does that layer height influence that, that, that mechanical behavior and, and, and build speed as well. And so we're taking a lot advantage of, of a lot of the physics we've learned from friction stir welding, except here that pin tool that you usually use with friction stir welding is re replaced by our, our feedstock that we're pushing through. And so then we're able to build up components like you see on the right of, a, of an actual uh, uh, aluminum component we fabricated and, and built up layer by layer. And, and really, you know, we've taken that, that hard uh, solid metal and we've generated, generated heat and plastic strain and, and really soften that so we can take advantage of that, that flow test temperature strain rate dependence to, to, to essentially spread that, that material out like a softened butter and build up layer by layer. And so, you know, I think it's, it's important to highlight, you know, why, why are we going with this approach? And, and one of the reasons is, you know, some of these materials, they, they really do not like liquid to solid phase transformations. So we can minimize solidification cracking, even vaporization of, of some of our alloying elements. Um, you know, we're, we're also able, we've, we've done this where we've been able to, to, to make functionally graded parts, control that, that behavior. We've even done this, uh, one of our current grad students, uh, Jessica Lopez, is, is looking at, at even using sand as, as a reinforcing material. Uh, you know, if you're just trying to make your, your feedstock like your aluminum go further uh, in, in an austere environment, you, you can even, even uh, put sand or, or regolith or, or even the uh, graphene or, or ceramic particles, and you can control that functional gradation of, of your, your, your depositions. Uh, there's some other benefits for this being in an austere environment is it's open atmosphere. And so, you, you know, similar to a, to a machining setup, uh, like a CNC, you know, very, very similar atmosphere used. Uh, the power requirements are actually very similar to a CNC, um, so it can be ran at an austere environment. We also have high deposition rates. And, you know, one of the, one of the great things is, is we can even repair with the same material we're, we're trying to, to, to repair that component of. And so that means we're, we're not adding in maybe any, any uh, deleterious electrochemical uh, reactions. Now, I think it's important to realize that, you know, there are some disadvantages. Uh, this is more of a near net shape process. You're likely going to need to do some, some finished machining or, or even this is an opportunity to, to turn this into a hybrid approach and, and couple this with, uh, you know, some other, other processes uh, where if you are, do want some, some high spatial resolution, you can do that. Um, you know, there are some, some, some challenges with, with hollow structures. Um, but we have been able to make hollow structures without any support material, so it really depends on what you're you're trying to do. Um, you know, continuous deposition is is still in the works uh, as, as this is getting developed. Um, and, and one of the things that that we've heard from the uh, the scientific community is, you know, we we really would like to to deposit round feedstock, um, and so that's still in development. Um, you know, Bond Technologies has actually been able to make a lot of headway on that uh, transitioning from that square uh, feedstock for hard alloys like titanium and, and super alloys to round feedstock, but, but it's still you know, uh, in development and, and not as developed as, as the, uh, the softer materials. 
Now, one of the things we're looking at in this project is really, you know, how can we look at, at two way streams that we'd have at a, at a forward operating base? And so here, you know, we really want to focus on direct out of recycling our, our components for, for repair or making new components. And this is uh, machine chips and battle damage equipment. And we want to do this and, and really understand the process so we can produce fully dense components with, with isotropic rock mechanical properties, really try and control and understand if we're getting any anisotropy. So, you know, when I say anisotropy or isotropic behavior, really it's can, if we pull it and do a tensile test in multiple orientations, is it the same in all those orientations? So that's really what we've been tasked with trying to understand and, and control. And, and so we've been working on that. And, and here, you know, it's really our, our two waste streams that, that you can see here are our strips of material and then the scraps of machine chips that you get from a, 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 an operating base. Now, as we do this, in this talk, I'm just gonna focus on the strips. Um, we have papers out there we're happy to share with you on our, on our work with uh, the machine chips as well. Uh, Dr. Jordan led, led some papers on that. So they're published in, in, in the references at the end of this talk. And so if we look at, you know, monolithic new material versus building from scrap material, you know, one of the first things we've done is, is we do this process parameter matrix, and really this is Brandon Phillips work, is, you know, what, what do we see visually as we start to deposit these materials? Do we see any differences? Um, and so you can see they, they deposit very similar. So this is strips on the top of material versus one solid feed rod. And, and then as we further look into this, you know, we, we looked at that microstructure. So we see a lot of grain refinement in both depositions. The hardness of these materials is very similar. Um, so, so at first glance, you're, you're seeing, you know, a, a refined microstructure in the deposit material, uh, whether it's solid rod or recycled feedstock with, with a very similar uh, mechanical behavior for, from a hardness standpoint. Uh, so here's a, a, a a figure of that kind of showing those grains from, from electron backscatter diffraction for the two, two deposits. And then we sent these samples up to our colleagues at Army Research Lab. They did X-ray computed tomography of these. And so what's great to see is, you know, no matter what uh, uh, our, our feedstock is, we see fully dense material with, with no, no voids or defects, even, even defects are, are not seen at, at the interfaces. Um, and so that's really encouraging. So then we started making larger builds. And so this is a, a 10 inch diameter, I think by a two inch tall build. So we get tensile coupons and fatigue coupons from it. And so here we started exploring the, the orientation and even this, this project was part of, you know, how, how does that deposition tool pass? So this is actually non-uniform layered heights. Um, Brandon Phillips, when he was a student before he went to work at the army, kind of came up with a, a way to, to deposit this like a, a helical screw. And, and one of the things we noticed as we did this is that uh, you know, no matter what orientation, 0, 45, or 90, the stress strain curves laid right on top of each other. And so as we focus on, on these, these uh, tensile behaviors, you saw in that previous plot, there, there was a drop in mechanical behavior that uh, you'd notice from like a T6 feedstock material. Now that, that tempering is, is lost, but one of the things we've, we've done or that precipitation hardening we've lost due to that thermal input. But you know, one of the things Dr. Dr. Beck did when she was a grad student was, was look at, hey, can we can we do that post-deposition heat treatment? You know, is this something you could possibly even do in a field? Or uh, you know, it goes back to like uh, what, what Mark Pepe has told us, you know, maybe it's just good enough manufacturing and uh, you know, it'll get us and allow us to complete a mission and we'll repin another part and as as we we uh, wait on getting a, a, a part that's heat treated. And so as we, we have uh, looked at the, the transmission electron microscopy, so really dive, dive down to the nanostructure. And on the left, we see this material. It really takes advantage of these, these beta double prime nanoprecipitates. And they're able to, to really provide that, that mechanical strength in, in our, our, our tensile behavior. And so, you know, these, these needle-like precipitates, you know, they, they help, uh, 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 um, 
pin dislocations as they're moving through our material, and we lose those in the, the uh, that, uh, that as the positive material, um, and so they, they really form those magnesium silicate clusters. Um, but then in the heat treatment, we're able to get those beta double primes back. And so that's really beneficial. So we get that, that strength back in our material. And so, you know, what does that mean from a mechanical behavior standpoint? And so here you can see we're, we're actually able to, to regain our strength. If, if we looked at our, our solution and aged uh, material in, in, in the red line, uh, compared to our, our black uh, feedstock material. Uh, and you know, you'll, you'll see there, there is that uh, as the positive material, with, which has longer uh, ductility, right? And, and we don't have those dislocation beta double primes pinning by, by uh, and so, so we, get, we get more increased dislocation motion. And that's why you see that ductility increase there. But as we get those beta double primes back, we get that strengthening mechanism, you know, we're able to regain that strength. And actually, we're taking advantage of some other strengthening mechanisms like hall patch, so that refined grain size, increasing strength, and actually getting even above the, the, the feedstock material strength. Now, you will notice, uh, I think it's important to look at fracture surfaces. And for all these fracture surfaces, you're, you're seeing that ductile fracture behavior, you know, characteristic uh, uh, microvoids, uh, coalescence beh behavior. Um, so that those dimples on that 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 that, that material, and so as we we've gone through this process and really started to understand how that microstructure evolves and the mechanical behavior, you know, then then I think it's important to kind of understand, you know, what what can we do as far as repair in the field, and and we do know that these uh, these airfield matting materials, uh, they they get damaged. You'll get things like you know, uh, forklift blades puncture through their skin. And so we did a simulated forklift puncture, as you can see here on the right, my mouse. And, you know, one of the first things we did is, you know, if we have that material, we, we have this mat, if we fixture it in our, our machine and we deposit that, that, uh, that secondary feedstock material and we can build that back up. And so we deposit that on top of that hole. And then we start to machine that flat to get back to tolerance. And so you'll notice, you know, it's, it's actually kind of hard to see that, uh, that repair interface. And so, you know, that's, that's one structure. And then with our, our colleagues at Army, Army Erdic and our current grad students, we've actually been, been doing subscale component tests of, of those repaired, repaired sections. But, you know, so that's more of a repair. What about if we want to make something new? And so this is where there, there's some other accessories that you'll have to, to hold these airfield landing mats down and, in the, uh, in austere environments. And so, you know, some of these are, are things like edge clamps that you'll put a, a stake here and it's a cruciform stake holding an edge clamp. And so, you know, if one of these get broken, you don't want your mat fly, flying up as, as you, you know, bring in your sorties. So we looked at, you know, cutting out a, a piece of our, 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 our damaged airfield, uh, building up so we deposited material back up to get it back up to tolerance of how thick we need that to be to, to carry that load. And then on the other side, where we'd want it to, to hold on and, and clamp to, to that, that, that other mat panel, we, we built up, I think this is about 12 layers of deposited material. And then we machine that back to our, our geometry. And since this is distribution A, I'm, I'm not showing that, that final machine geometry. Um, but if, if you wanna talk about that at any time, please please shoot me an email and we can, we can discuss that further. But so it's, it's really interesting that, that from an old, uh, you know, secondary battle damage equipment, we can create a new component from it. And so I, I think it's important to not just run trial and error experiments, but, but to really couple them with uh, computational work. And this has allowed us, and this is, this is Dr. Stubblefield's work in collaboration with our, our colleague, uh, Dr. Kirk Fraser at, at National Research Council Canada. Um, and so when George was doing his dissertation before uh, he left to go work at Army Erdic, you know, he was really uh, adapting a, a meshless. So we really like the meshless approaches like smooth particle hydrodynamics to capture that large plastic deformations you have in, in a process like this or friction stir welding. Um, and, and so it really helps us minimize how many trials we're doing, uh, understanding the process parameters, the tooling uh, that you want to, to generate frictional heat from the, that, that shoulders. 
And, and so this was really helpful as, as we can understand that plastic strain temperature and feed this in, into, into sort of our, our, our next uh, uh, material models to, to be able to predict mechanical behavior. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's, it's important to, to couple this, this computational work with the experimental work. Uh, and so, so really, as we look at it, some of the things we've, we've understood from this is, you know, understanding that, that micro and nanostructure evolution during our AFSD process, uh, understanding that you, you've got material and, you know, what do you need to do if you want to use it as is? Maybe if it's a precipitation hardened alloy, you know, you, you can... You can understand how many how many cycles of failure you'd get in the as deposit condition, and then you know, some of our, our former students uh, like uh, Sadie Bex and Ben Rutherford, who's also one of our other students that's at Erdic, really really dove into the, the post deposition heat treatment on these uh, uh, depo depositions, getting back to that mechanical strength um, so you can take advantage of those those beta lipoprimes primes in the 6061 alloy, um, and and we you know out of this work uh, with Certip, we, we've really been able to generate some new computational tools. They can can help our colleagues that are interested in these processes that, that you know depots or other installations like like uh, Carter Rock, uh, and uh, you know we, we've actually been able to to repair some material and also fabricate some new components. So that's really really been great. And then you know as we've been working on this, uh, we actually had a had a call with uh, Letter Candy Army Depot as as well as our, our colleague or our former student Brandon Phillips with with ABMC and seeing how how can we transition this maybe even to to depots and and, and help you know do do some work there to to benefit their their modernization priorities um, and and really try and get this where it's uh, uh, you know further advanced with our our commercial partners. Um, and, and so there, there's a deliverable that can, can be set up at, at, at somebody's location. You know, one of the things is uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab and, and Bond Technologies are, have already been looking at, at how to take things like chips and powders and, and turn those into solid rod feedstocks. And so their, their shape equipment is able to do that. And then you can feed that into this machine, um, which is an AFSD machine that um, uh, is, is part of an Army Research Lab program. And really, you know, combining this experimental and, and uh, uh, computational efforts, we can understand, you know, how do we need to repair or build new components at, at forward operating bases to, to help uh, from, from a sustainability standpoint. And so again, I, I think it's important to acknowledge the great work by, by our former students and collaborators. Uh, so, you know, uh, I mentioned, uh, Brandon and, and Dustin and Sadie and, and Ben and George and Taylor. So it's really great to see you know, how they've been able to, to take what they've learned in the labs, they've been educated, transition that to the work they're doing with the DOD or the Department of Energy, or, or even educating new students, the next generation that can carry this work on. And I, I really appreciate my, my work from my collaborators, uh, Brian and, and Luke and, and Kevin Doherty. Uh, there's you know lots of publications that came out of this work. Happy to share those with you guys. Um, they're here. If you guys need any more, please shoot me an email. Happy to happy to share those from that standpoint as well. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. We've received a number of questions that we're going to relay to you. But just a quick reminder to our audience to please submit questions using the Q and A box on your screen. Uh, we're going to start off with a question from the Naval Sea System Command and SWC Carderock. And the question is along the lines of, uh, are you doing additional work beyond what you described at FOBs, for example, at the point of the fight? Yeah, thank you. So, so if I under, understand, is is there other work we we've got going on in in this realm, um, and, and not just what I've shown here? And and yes, we we've got some work. Um, we've actually got a, a another sort of program that's that's being led by by Dr. Brian Jordan on uh, repairing uh, fifth generation aircraft. Uh, and so, you know, you looking at using the same material that that uh, gets damaged from corrosion or battle damage. And repairing that, we've also had some, some other work uh, with Dr. Doherty, looking at repair of uh, steels using that same material to repair these these uh, these high hard steels. 
Um, and, and then it's, it's even expanded to Department of Energy. Um, we've had a program, uh, uh, you know, looking at, you know, how can we repair nuclear storage canisters? So a, a 304 stainless steel, you know, those, those get damaged, corrosion damage. You know, how can we deposit that same material um, and, and re repair those uh, assets as well? Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, working in with uh, um, Martin McDonald doing, doing some work with, with some of our current grad students right now at GVSC on, on uh, the Jointless Hall program. So, so still, ha you know, having a lot of fun working on this. Uh, got a lot of great students and, and collaborators from DOD where, where we're able to expand this out to, to different areas and different material systems as well. Um, so that, that's been really exciting and fun too. Thank you, Paul. Uh, can a manufacturer use the processes you described to use in-house scraps, for example, for processing metal at recycled facilities? Uh, so that, this that's is a, from that's a, a retired great... air quality engineer, by the way. Yeah. So, so no, I, I think that's a, that's exactly one of the things is uh, you know not just maybe doing this at, at forward operating bases. But you know you can you could do this at a at a depot or even a, a small business that maybe you know they've got a, their own machining operation and really help you know even rural manufacturing you know maybe, maybe you have this this expensive alloy you bought uh, you machined it to your final part and, and now yeah you can you can take this uh, that scrap whether it's machine chips or strips of material and and even you know go go through this process and, and deposit it back in, into new components or repair old components um, so so it's definitely something that, that can be transitioned to to more than just the uh, the uh, the the DoD installations fantastic and are you able to use this process for joining plates too instead of just building parts yeah, so that's 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 a really good question too. And so, are are we able to join and not just you know look at look at depositing material for for building up, but but that's actually uh, some other work we we've been doing with with uh, uh, Dr. Rushing at Army Erdic and, and our our current student uh, Jacob Strain, looking at you know if if we we don't necessarily have the the machine with the necessary force to do friction stir welding since it's a higher higher forge force process than this. Uh, you know, can you use this process to, to join those materials together? And, and so, you know, we've been exploring, you know, how, how big a grooves you can have between what, what type of maybe weld you want to do to join your material together. And the great thing is, you know, we're depositing that same material. So really trying to avoid maybe, maybe uh, you know, any, any defects or, or intermetallics that may form that, that could be deleterious from a mechanical behavior standpoint. Thank you. Uh, here's a question about the impact of contaminants. Do contaminants, things like sand, cause any problems to the deposited material? That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question as, as well about, you know, how, how clean does your feedstock need to be? And that's one of the things we looked at in this program. And, and so uh, we, we were able to, to, to jam feedstock in the, in the machine. Um, this unfortunately made our students have to take the machine apart. So, so if you do have too much, uh, too much contamination of, of maybe some sand uh, on, on your feedstock, which I think we had coated it very heavily with, with uh, sand particles, well, we really it, it minimize or it increased that friction between the, the feedstock material coming out of our, our tool. And, and we, did, uh, we did overload our, our, our sort of pusher rod there. Um, so, so there is some type uh, of uh, uh, maybe contamination you want to minimize on your material. So, you know, even even just wiping off the sand with a uh, a, a towel or something would, would be beneficial. But then on the other opposite side, you know, Jessica, our other former student or our current student, is is looking at putting sand and encapsulating it in inside the rod. So we, we're not really having that friction issue. But you are able to deposit that material mixed with the sand and. and and create a metal matrix composite. So there, there is a lot of robustness to this, which is exciting. Thank you. And here's a question about adapting the machine um, for uh, other alloys. How much adaptation is required, if any, to deposit hard alloys like steel or titanium? So, so. Uh, Good, good question. Because this this is a process where you do want to deposit more than just maybe soft alloys like 
like aluminum or magnesium alloys. Um, and, and so it, it really goes back to, to changing out that, that tool material. So that, that material that's in contact with your, your feed rod and your substrate. Or, and, and so, you know, that, that requires maybe going from a tool steel tool to a, a tungsten uranium tool uh, or, or even tungsten uh, lanthanum tool. Uh, so, so you, you, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to worry about as much wear. Um, I will, I will say, you know, for, for titanium and stainless steel alloys, um, we've, we've been able to deposit thousands of linear feet with our, our, our current tools. Uh, and so, you know, you do get a lot more tool life than you do with, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a friction stir weld tool. So that, that's really exciting from that standpoint, from a cost savings and, and from, from actually the, the materials for the tool and, and the downtime to, to replace tools. Oh, that's awesome. What about the fatigue performance of the deposited material? So, so that, that's a, a good question because, you know, most of our materials are not just monotonically loaded, right, or our components. And so, you know, we, we've got papers out there on, on this as well for, for a variety of materials. And Dustin Avery has shown some work on uh, ink and L materials that, that he's deposited. Uh, and, and so, you know, we've been able to take advantage of, of a refinement in the carbides in those ink and L's. And so they were, they were smaller in size. Um, and, and we actually got better fatigue performance in, in, in those materials than, than rot. Um, now on, on the aluminum alloys, you know, it goes back to the, especially the precipitation hardened aluminum alloys. So, you know, you, you lose that, that, uh, uh, strengthening precipitate phase, whether it's a, a 7,000, a 2,000, or a, a, a 6,000. And so it's going to per perform more like, like an O-temper material. And so that's one thing we saw. Um, but then we've also done the post-deposition heat treatments to get back to that uh, uh, precipitation hardened uh, state. And you can get back to that rot material behavior with this as well. Um, we, we've looked at 5083 as well. So uh, more of a, a a strained hardened, worked hardened material. Um, and, and so, you know, it, again, it goes back to you are generating heat into that process. You deposit that material, so you will lose some of your, your, your strengthening mechanisms. Um, and, and so it's going to perform more like a material that, that hasn't uh, um, been, been, uh, been through a post-processing process. And so you will need to do a, a post-deposition heat treatment. And actually, that's one of the things we're looking at is, is you know, is there ways to do in-situ um, heat treatments on this as well and, and try and get to that that rot like uh, post process state as it's deposited. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. We're going to take one last question and then shift gears to Prabhat, but we'll make sure to get back to you towards the end uh, of the webinar. Um, what happens if uh, you mix um, strips or machine chips from different aluminum alloys as the feedstock oh that's that's a that's a really exciting question and so, and so that's one of the things we we really um looked at as, as far as you know if if you if you're not if you don't have a handheld xrf hand, uh, available to you and or or spectroscopy and you, you have you know your your machining scraps that have been mixed together with different aluminum alloys can you still deposit them? And, and so uh, we, we've actually been able to do that. And so, you know, kind of, kind of, it, it creates an essentially maybe an in-situ alloy for we're making new aluminum alloys as we do that. And so, uh, you know, you do get different mechanical performance than what you'd expect from your, your traditional, you know, individual rod alloys. It's, it's more of a composite, but it's been exciting. We are able to, to manufacture those and, and create those materials. Um, from, from an in-situ alloying standpoint and, you know, just using what you got to make sure you maybe have a part that's just good enough. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. We, we do still have outstanding questions. I promise we'll get back to them, but it is uh, now time to thank you for a phenomenal presentation uh, and to shift gears to our second speaker, Dr. Prabhat Krishnaswamy, who is the co-founder of EMC2. Uh, EMC2 is an engineering research and development consulting company focused on materials, structural integrity, and reliability of complex systems. Uh, prior to forming or founding EMC2, 
Uh, Dr. Krishna Swami was a senior scientist at the Battelle Memorial Institute. He has conducted extensive research in both analytical and experimental areas of engineering mechanics and is a renowned expert in the mechanical and failure behavior of plastics, composites, and bio-based materials. Um, Prabhat uh, received his doctoral degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Washington, Seattle. Prabhat, please proceed. Thank you, Rola, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to CERDEP for giving us the opportunity to uh, present the, our work on this CERDEP project, uh, specifically Dr. Preston and Dr. Nissan. As Rula said, uh, our talk is involves the, our CERTA project on um, developing mobile manufacturing plan for converting recycled thermoplastics, secondary materials at forward operating bases into uh, useful products uh, for the warfighter, for the service member. The rest of the first slide is just station identification for me and my company. Um, my presentation outline involves just going over project overview and technical approach very briefly. And a large part of the presentation will focus on the results uh, to date. We are in the final, final year of our, of our project now. And uh, I'll share with you the results we've had to date and then wrap up with conclusions and also the benefits to DOD at large. So the project overall goals, as, as we stated, is to comply, is to conduct applied research. And this is uh, something that Dr. Preston alluded to earlier about doing pilot scale work, where we are gonna be, where we have designed agile mob, mobile manufacturing plants for converting recycled plastics. And we need to convert this, the, uh, the materials into useful products on site uh, using the waste materials available there. The, obviously the, the project has an impact, direct impact on enhancing DOD's mission effectiveness by converting the waste plastics like PET from water bottles that are as much as half a pound per person per day into useful products uh, at FOBs, PET being polyethylene terephthalate. Uh, the deliverables, the end deliverables from this project would involve modular uh, designs of manufacturing plants, all of which can be contained in 20 foot ISO containers. So they can, the plants can be designed and installed into 20 foot containers and shipped to FOBs to be able to operate there uh, by configuring, the, configuring one or more containers as needed to be able to manufacture the end product. Uh, currently, as a follow-on to the CERDA project, we have our uh, partner, a team member at CERL, Erdic CERL, the Army Corps, that has submitted a proposal to do the demonstration and validation phase for this work. Uh, the overall technical approach is summarized with some photographs on this uh, on this slide, and there are essentially four tasks that go on if you go from left to right. We have, say, PED water bottles that are available uh, after use as secondary materials. And we have to take that and go through a sorting and washing line to be able to convert it to clean flake. And once we have a clean flake, we can do, we can take one of two routes. One is to make the, as shown here, is to go make filament for additive manufacturing, which where once, and you, once you have the filament made to spec, you can print parts directly on the base. This is produces the point of need, high value product, but it consumes smaller amounts of waste materials. Uh, it doesn't consume even a small percentage of what the waste is generated, thermoplastics waste and base. As an alternative path, we've also been looking at uh, technologies and developing technologies and plants that can convert larger volumes of RPET uh, waste into products such as dimensional lumber. And I'll go into this in more details. Typically dimensional lumber or plastic lumber is produced from milk bottles, which is high density polyethylene, 
but we are trying to we are investigated how to make that with ARPET material ARPET materials available in base. As I said, uh, that summarizes our technical approach, and we'll go into the results of the various tasks and what we found to date. The very first thing that I'm showing you are the is the same graph or the uh, the design of the sorting and washing line that contain that uh, involves three 20 foot containers. Uh, the first container just takes the bottle and sorts it, singulates it, and flattens it. So the, as the bottle comes in here, the, the, at the exit of this container, you get a flattened bottle. The second the container takes in the flattened bottle and converts it to a ground flake, or that is, uh, and it's, it's, it's separate, it is a separating bin, it's ground to size, and then separates with a cyclone. So you have a flake that's the output of the second container. The third container essentially is washing with the hydrocyclone and has float sink tank, and it delivers a clean flake via spin dryer. So it's a dry, clean flake that is delivered out of the plant. So you start with a water bottle and you end up with a clean flake that can be used for additive manufacturing or the other products. The scale of operation here is, is at 300 pounds an hour. And we are also looking at smaller systems for smaller bases, uh, much smaller than 300 pounds an hour, a version of this as well. Uh, once you have a flake, then the question is, how do you create an appropriate formulation before you make a product? Uh, stateside, uh, the ARPET industry is very mature. There are plants that make 70, 80 million pounds a year of recycled PET for various applications and you can make them into pellets, convert the uh, flake into pellets before doing anything, you use the same flake as is, and then you have green flake or flakes with other contaminants that can be used for different products. So you have the, the next phase, the second phase after you get a clean flake is to develop an appropriate formulation. So we have a, a 300 pound an hour system that's been designed. And we have done trials at various vendors locations to make sure that we can make the clean white flake. And what did we, one of the major things, one of the major takeaways from this slide is that one complicating factor is the labels on water bottles. At bases, you can get water bottles with labels and you can get water bottles without labels. The labels and the adhesives significantly complicate the steps involved in the washing and sorting line, but we have been able to design steps to overcome, uh, overcome those and be able to handle both kinds of uh, water bottles uh, at the base. And both and using either raw material, you can convert it to a consistent clean uh, four millimeter or so flake uh, for further use, the modular systems. So once we have the flake, then the next question is, before we get to additive manufacturing, we have to extrude a filament from it. So the next set of trials that we conducted involves taking the, not just the pellets, our pet pellets, but also the flakes and designing the equipment configuration needed to make uh, both, both uh, diameters of filaments used in additive manufacturing for plastics that's 1.75 and 2.85 millimeters. There's my colleague Rick Heggs on the line as we were uh, running these trials at a vendor site. And what we did was to successfully make this filament in both diameters, very consistent, very clean. And then the next step was to see, can we, how do we configure equipment into ISO containers for a mobile system at FOBs? And this shows a schematic of what the system looks like. Our actual uh, information involves a specification for each particular piece of equipment in these 20 foot containers. So we have start with PET susceptible to moisture. So you have a drying that starts, that's shown on the, on the right. You have an extruder, water bath to cool the, cool the filament. And then you have a puller, a controller, a rewinder for the for the filament and the seal station, and the entire system can be can be shipped in a single container, 
And for a layout of operation, it has to be because the length of cooling required, length, uh, length required for cooling, it operates under two 20 foot containers that are joined together. So now we have the water bottle go to the flake. Flake can, we've proven that we can go to the filament and we have a system that uh, has been designed to do an extrude filament in 20 foot containers. Uh, the additive manif once we have the filament, what we ne did next is to try it out in several different printers to make sure that commercial av available printers like Ultimate Arrays 3D, all Lulzbot can all print parts with it. And what we found out that for each of these printers, we needed to optimize the processing parameters. So it's the same filament with, diff with slightly different uh, processing parameters. We can print parts successfully using any printer. We use the Lulzbot to characterize the material further, that is to make ASTM specimens to evaluate properties that could be useful in design. So those show some photographs of parts that we've made with the RPET. These are the calibration parts. You have the ASTM bars here. This is a radio bracket. The model was provided to us by ARL. Mark Pepe and his colleagues uh, provided us a uh, SDL file for the for the radio bracket, and we were able to model that and print it successfully. We also printed this 90 degree transmission gear to see if the precision and the, the tolerance was tight enough for the gears to work, and it did. And you have some other parts that are just shown here that we could print directly from our PET filament. Once we have the ASTM specimens, the next question is, what kind of properties can we expect? With the uh, with the R uh, with the R pet, uh, if you print a part, what would be the and, the and the two major properties that you look for are stiffness and strength. And stiffness is represented by flexural modulus, and strength is just tensile strength. So what we did was to compare the properties of our, our AM printed materials, our three D printed materials for R pet with those that were injection molded, and with a standard engineering plastics such as ABS. And what we found was that the RPET properties would be lower than the injection molded just because it's uh, the injection mold is, uh, is much densely, uh, the material is much more densely packed. But the properties, both stiffness and strength are comparable to an engineering plastic like ABS. So if there's an ABS part that breaks, uh, that you can use the RPET to be able to replace and make a replacement part right there with uh, available materials. The next thing we did as a result of discussions with CERDEP and its technical committee was, can we introduce some additives into the formulation to enhance properties? And specifically the property of interest was to increase ductility since our pet has low elongation to failure or it can fail in a brittle manner. And we tried several different uh, additive packages and we found that uh, something like a craton uh, can, can help increase ductility significantly. So you have, without the craton, the elongation, the elongation to failure increases significantly by almost 55% and it's comparable to or even exceeds the uh, other plastics such as ABS or PETG and PLA, they are comparable to that in terms of its performance. Uh, once we have ASTM parts, we have properties, we know we can design parts, then the question is, can you actually print the parts? Mm -hmm. And so again, we are uh, colleagues at Erdex Searl, along with uh, the technical advisors and uh, from uh, CERDEP, Mark Pepe and uh, others, were able to help us identify a list of parts that could be useful for printing at the base. Uh, the very first one is a public domain part. It's a 55 gallon drum wrench that you can obtain these drawings directly from the, from the web. And we were able to print several different models of this 55 gallon drum wrench very successfully. We tried them on the drums and they worked very well. So it proves that we can print parts that are useful. There are several other parts here on the, on the list that are being printed by CERL <coughs> due to its, uh, the classified nature of, it, of, the, uh, of the geometry and the material of the parts. We cannot share this, but we've been able to print several of these uh, at the Army Corps lab. 
Uh, the next question comes up is, okay, we have printed parts from filament made from RPET, made from water bottles. The question was, can we go directly from the RPET flakes all the way to just printing with them? Can I, that means you avoid several steps in between there are several pieces of manufacturing equipment. There are several commercial available 3D printers of it, that can print directly from pellets. That means you don't need a filament to do so. And what we did was to conduct some trials with two vendors to see if we can print with flakes rather than pellets. And we had we have had uh, this has been going on in the only in the last month a month and a half. This is our latest work on AM, and we've had pretty good success to date in terms of printing a, printing a calibration cylinder uh, part, the demo a de kind of a demo part, and this hollow box which is like 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches hollow box using directly from the flake, and. Once we are further along on this and we show that we can we have reliable properties going directly from the flake all the way to the part, this would be a significant breakthrough as it is you don't need to go through the process of filament extrusion and all that. So this is our current work that, that's ongoing. Shifting gears, the next pro product we looked at was involved uh, uh, making dimensional lumber. We completed trials at a vendor site using a very rudimentary process, very easily easily adaptable to FOB conditions called flow molding. And we were able to make uh, to make one by one and two by four dimensional lumber 36 inches long or higher. And once we showed that we could do this, uh, uh, make some dimensional lumber, the next uh, step was to go to the manufacturer of the equipment to work with them to see if we could design the entire system into 20 foot containers. And with his help and our, uh, our guidance uh, from our team, we were able to design the entire plastic lumber extrusion system with flow molding in two 20 foot containers that could be shipped and then interlocked at the, at the base to be able to operate. So you have the heat exchanger on one end, the extruder, the tooling and the molds, and the cooling tank is here, the railings that would bring in the molds and then the storage rack to cool the materials. So we did the trials, then we designed the, designed the system uh, to be able to make this RPET based plastic lumber kind of dimensions. And then the next thing is to see what, how, what, what parameters uh, are required need to control to be able to make this successfully. And the most important parameter there is how do you cool the plastic lumber after it's molded and water cooling was found to be the most effective. Here are some photographs of the one by one and the two by fours that we did. Once we did the plastic lumber extrusions, the trials, the next question obviously is what are the properties? How do they compare to wood versus other plastic lumber? And so we, the most important characteristics for plastic lumber is the flexural properties, the bending, and ASTM 6109 uh, is used to evaluate those. And what is shown here is the stress strain of the, from the flex test. There's the wood in black and the HDP based plastic lumber uh, that is that we can get uh, commercially now stateside. And our RPET showed very significant improvement over traditional plastic lumber with HDP, much higher stiffness and strength. And it goes all the way to 3% uh, strain, which that is defined as failure. So it has significant ductility as well as strength. Uh, and with the use of additives, we can enhance the ductility even more. So that was a very interesting and useful result. The next major step that we evaluated was we have done RPET, very high quality clean flake for additive manufacturing. Then we did a plastic lumber, which can tolerate some contaminants. And then the question came up, you have a large amount of mixed plastics waste at the base. Are there technology that can convert uh, plastics two, two, two through seven into any useful products? And it turns out that there is a company that has this technology and all we had to do is to evaluate it and see how it could be modified for FOB conditions. And what they do is take mixed plastics waste and make what is called by blocks, which are in the dimensions of CMUs like eight by eight by 16 and can be used for light structural applications outdoors. And those are what the blocks look like. 
when we made them out of some RPET formulations. And the most important property to test for these blocks is compression, as we had flexural for plastic lumber, compression for CMUs. And we tested those and for two different formulations. And in each case, the maximum load in compression exceeded 40,000 pounds. So it's significant without shattering or failing. The material is extremely soft. So even at 3% uh, strain, you still have over 5,000 pound load capacity for each block. What's shown at the bottom here is a demonstration project that the, the company that we are working with uh, did in Hawaii involving a pavilion. Uh, they installed a pavilion using the by block as being the walls with the uh, carpentry around it. And that's the finished pavilion. And what our goal was, uh, before we get to the goal, uh, uh, once we got the properties uh, that we thought were acceptable, then we went back and said, can we design your the by block plant to be in 20 to operate in 20 foot containers, their, their standard involved, the standard plant can be installed in 140 foot containers. And what they did was separate the equipment out in a, in a very logical manner. And uh, where they were able to design it on paper to, be, to operate on two containers as shown there. And this would still have the capacity of about 30 tons per month. Uh, of converting mixed plastics waste into uh, CMU kind of light construction blocks. Uh, once we did that, then the next phase, next step was to evaluate, can we build a structure like this, a demonstration structure on a Army Corps or a base site? And Erdex Searle was involved in that, has been involved in that. And that's what they are doing right now as we speak in the last few weeks. What we did was to design is have, have the, the BiBlock folks, the company called BiFusion, design the storage shed for a demonstration project. And that's the design that they came up with. And that's what is being built currently at Erdex Searle. Uh, the BiBlock portion of it is complete. And then they have to do the roof and everything else. We expect that to be done la completed later in spring or early summer. So it's it, in terms of lessons learned and recommendations of how to use BiBlock uh, for light construction applications outdoors. With that, we get to our wrap up conclusions to date. And the major conclusion is we can use waste thermoplastics uh, and, into, and convert them to useful products at FOBs. We've designed four mobile agile manufacturing plants that can be sh uh, designed and installed and shipped in 20 foot containers. The first one is to convert flake to uh, convert bottles to flake. The second one involves the extruding filament for AM, AM uh, manufacturing. Uh, the third one is converting uh, uh, RPET and some mixed plastics into plastic lumber. And the fourth is the mixed plastics waste into uh, construction type of by blocks. Uh, the properties of the AM filament are, compared to, are comparable to engineering plastics, which is a major uh, finding. The, the impact modifiers can enhance ductility significantly for the RPET. And we are now looking at make converting flakes to parts without the need of filament. And if this is successful, that'll be another significant step forward. The art pet based dimensional lumber has properties for outdoor uses and so does uh, by block for our light outdoor structures. Uh, the benefit slide obviously mirrors the conclusions to date. So you can solve the thermoplastics issues uh, at, at the base and simultaneously create products that are useful at the point of need for the warfighter. Uh, water bottles can be converted to clean flake and clean flake into parts. I'm, I'm repeating my, the conclusions out here. And the most important, the, one of the more important results is you can do larger mixed plastics, RPET flake into dimensional profiles and by blocks. And we are now developing technologies to kind of miniaturize the sorting and washing lines for much smaller base applications, 
Uh, so you can, it, you you only have like a hundred pounds a day or so, and that's what we are currently looking to see if we can miniaturize it into just a single twenty foot container that converts the the bottle into flake, and that's ongoing. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the rest of our team, Rick Heggs from EMC Squared, as well as Sushma and uh, and Cameron, who helped us with the lab work. Erdik Searle, we have uh, Pete Sainowski, Jonathan Trevelyan, and Steve Cosper. Dr. Nissan at CERDAP ESTCP has been uh, has led and championed our project from the very uh, initial stages. And uh, Mark Pepe from ARL. And Braxton Lewis at Noblis has been our program manager uh, who's handled uh, this project for us. Uh, you can have additional information here. If you contact me, I can send you also a list of papers and uh, that we've published based on our work. And uh, uh, if you have other questions, I'll I'll take them offline or or when or in the next few minutes uh, as Rula uh, or the as the moderators uh, share with us. Uh, the questions. One of the things I want to emphasize is that this has been a team effort with uh, with several organizations involved, and I'll do the best I can to answer the questions. If I can't, then I will can I will ensure you that we will get the answers for you if you share your contact information with us, because the other team members may not be able to chime in today. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Prabhat. Uh, when do you expect to have your final report uploaded to this website, or is it already there? No, it's. Uh, we expect the final report to be uploaded by the end of this year. That's when our, our contract goes through to the end of this year, and we think by fall time frame we'll have the final report done. We expect to have the draft by September, October, and then shortly thereafter to finalize it. Wonderful. So a reminder for everyone, if you'd like the details on Prabhat's work, you can always contact him or check back in the fall for uh, to download for free a copy of that report. So Prabhat, we got a number of questions for you. The first one is from the Idaho National Lab. How much water is consumed by your process at full scale operation? I, I have that number for the cooling. I'm assuming you're talking about the filament, is it the filament line or the, or the plastic lumber line? Each one, I mean, depending on the scale of operation, the amount of water required is, is, uh, can vary. The way we have designed the equipment for each container is you need to have a, a power input and water input to be able to get this, uh, the systems off the ground. We have the detailed numbers, but I don't have it at the top of my head, and I can dig that information up for each of those systems and provide it to the gentleman or lady who asked the question. Great, thank you so much. This next question is from the Cornerstone Research Group. Have you looked or evaluated the impact of amorphous versus crystalline PET and how it impacts your finer, final material properties? Uh, the, we have the, the material uh, as we process it, especially during AM manufacturing of the, of the RPET flake, tends to crystallize and create some issues at the point as you're printing the part. We have been able to, that's, which is what I meant when I said for each, each of the printers, we have, to, we have to modify the processing conditions so it prints successfully and not clog the nozzle. It is quite important for our pet not to have any moisture. I mean, it has to be below a certain value and I have that number as well to be able to print the parts. Fantastic. Okay, uh, this uh, next question uh, is, um, it refers back to the earlier question uh, that was asked uh, regarding the water usage, it's specifically yes. the water used during the washing process. Can you try and uh, provide an estimate of the amount of water needed? The, the, the water is, the, the way the system is designed, the water is, uh, is, is reused. It's a closed loop circulating system with makeup water provided. So I will 
I will get back to the exact design. That was the very first thing we designed about a couple of years ago. And I'll go back to the design specs and get back to you on that rather than shoot, try to just stay from the, but it is a makeup water system to be able to wash the PET. Fantastic. I'll provide you with the contact information for the individual asking this question. And, and, and I will follow this, up. Yeah. Wonderful. This next question is from the Naval Sea System Command, NSWC Carderock. Do the by blocks float? Are they heavier than water? Do they sink or uh, do they float? Do they float? The density, I've got the dimensions and the, and the weight. I believe they have enough polyethylene in them that they will they will float. But I uh, the um, the 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 focus of the by block and the comp the technology that they are doing is to make it denser to get higher properties rather than make it lighter to float. So it is it is a uh, the the most recent by block that they made as recently as last couple of months ago the ver the the version of the by block is much denser than the first first set of by blocks we got from them. Uh, almost two, three, two and a half years ago. So I believe they they are now moving towards a much more dense by block. Uh, Rick Heggs, my colleague, visited them just a few weeks ago, and I don't know whether he can chime in on this or not. I don't think he can. Uh, no, everybody else is on mute. Okay. We'll try and get you the also the contact information. And I, I get you, so I'll you get you the exact up. density. I can get you the exact density, the 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 weight of the current by blocks along the dimensions and all that. Fantastic. Uh, Prabhat, can you tell us why you focused on RPET and not other thermoplastics in your uh, work? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, there was a study done by uh, DOD and our colleagues at uh, our team members at the Army Corps of Engineers in Champaign, Illinois, uh, provide us with the base, uh, the, the way they actually did the analysis of the, of the waste materials at different bases. And amongst the thermoplastics at the base, the highest volume, the, the largest amount of waste was from RPET followed by polyethylene. So those two are clearly the priorities when you are dealing with thermoplastics waste on base. And that's why uh, uh, we, we focused our efforts on the, on the water bottles and the beverage bottles PET, that, the, because that is the largest component of thermoplastics waste. Great, thank you so much. Um, can the equipment designed for processing our pet be adapted for other waste thermoplastic materials or can it not? Uh, that was the other, there's another uh, uh, very valuable uh, question for insight. I mean, if you have designed a system, the obvious question is what else can it be used for? And what we did is work with the, the, the vendors of that particular system of equipment to see how, what, what aspect needs to be changed to be able to use that equipment for say high density polyethylene. And we are in the process of finalizing that, those recommendations. So if you have one system with minor modifications, it can be used also for polyethylene. And we are in the process of finalizing that particular variation of design to make the system much more versatile and not just restricted to our pet water bottles. Fantastic. Um, can you just succinctly summarize some of the pros and cons for being able to print directly from flake instead of filament? Uh, yes, the, 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 the most significant advantage is you need a clean flake directly made from water bottles. And right now, as I said, we are designing a much smaller system that will do only take only the water bottles and convert it to flake at a much lower rate because you don't need much material for additive manufacturing. And once you have a clean flake, if you can print a part directly from there, you've avoided several steps in between, which, which originally would involve converting the flake, going through a melt filtration process to get a pellet, and then going from the pellet 
to the to making a filament and then going from a filament to a uh, for to a part so the two intermediate steps of making pellets and filaments are completely eliminated from uh, if you go directly from flake to a printed part however the downside is most additive manufacturing printers for plastics right now are designed to take filaments. So, and there are only two or three that we know of that can actually handle either pellets and the flake portion is what we are working on. So it will not be as versatile as taking a, once you have a filament, a number of printers become available for printing parts. If you go directly from flake to the printer, you may be restricted to restricted only those few that can make it uh, that can use a flake or a pellet. Great. And, and two quick questions from audience members about the type of bottles. Can you use soda bottles instead of water bottles? And do you need to separate the caps from the bottle? Yes, the the soda bottles, the the for for the additive manufacturing portion, we have the way we have developed the system is to use water bottles and preferably without the labels because that'll and then take the, the caps can be taken uh, is they are taken care of the propane caps are taken care of by the sorting and washing line so that's caps are not an issue but the the adhesive and the and the and the labels are an issue specifically for the filament manufacturer so uh the short answer for that is the system if you if you need to use the system for additive manufacturing it's best to use a water bottle preferably without the label for all the other products for the plastic lumber line any of the any of the arpets would would be suitable any sort of bottles could be easily be used because the, the plastic, the dimensional lumber line is much more forgiving in terms of the level of contaminant uh, involved, especially in a flow molding process. And obviously by blocks can take mixed plastics waste. So there is no real, uh, there's no reason not to include our pet soda bottles in there. Great. One last question before we pull Paul back in. Uh, this is a question from the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Are the by-blocks uh, thermally connected in building structures? No, they are mechanically connected. They are they are they are connected to as uh, like Lego blocks on a on a threaded screw, and then you have a plate put on it, and we'll have a report on how exactly the the construction took place in the demo project at Searle for and and what are their uh, best practices recommendations for designing with by blocks but they are like lego blocks that are that are piled on each other and they have a uh, they have mating parts if you will from the top surface to the bottom surface wonderful they are not, they are well, not thermally fused not thermally fused okay other. thank you so much we're going to go ahead and pull uh paul back in for some wrap up questions uh, for both of your systems, Paul and Prabhat, and we'll start with Paul, what is the level of skill and experience needed to operate the equipment? Do you have to have a contractor on site or on site personnel um, can, uh, can do uh, the operation themselves? Uh, Paul? Yeah, so so that's a that's a really good question, um, and and so the the level of skill required is, is similar to a a machinist. So um, you know somebody who knows how to to operate a, a like a milling machine platform could operate this machine. Um, obviously, I've got got grad students running my machine. We do have a technician as well, but but it's it's not a, a highly skilled. It's very similar to um, you know someone you'd have running a friction stir welding machine at a, at a production facility or uh or, or a machining uh, center over thank you so much paul and Prabhat, what about your system what is the level of skill required to operate it yeah i'll go through the the systems that we've designed and what skills it takes to operate them the 
The sorting and washing line is essentially the operator skill of a regular technician or a manufacturing person. Uh, it, it's very low skill set that's required to do the sorting and washing line to operate that uh, once it's set up and uh, to go. The, the filament line can be quite finicky, which is the reason why we were trying to, uh, to see if there are ways to get around the filament line to go directly from the flake to the final part. The filament line takes some experience, plastics processing operator kind of experience to be able to operate the extrusion line. The plastic lumber line, on the other hand, is a lot more forgiving the way we've designed it. The technology we chose for plastic lumber is called flow molding, which is essentially melt the plastic and fill a mold. And it, then you cool the mold to get the final part. That's relatively easy and much much level, some, some training is required, but not nowhere near the what is required for the, say, a filament, uh, to operate a filament extrusion line. The by block, again, is uh, is being designed to have a almost an unskilled operator with a few days worth of experience to be able to fill the, to, to essentially uh, fill the machine with the mixed plastics waste and take the by blocks out when they are done. So the first and fourth line, the the sorting line and the by block line require very low skill set, and the filament line takes the highest skill set. Great. Well, thank you so much, Paul and Prabhat, for your time today. Before we wrap up, I'd like to remind our audience members that we have another webinar in two weeks on May 5. And this upcoming one will feature DOD funded research efforts to develop reliable tools for assessing the environmental risks of PFAS. This webinar will feature Dr. Paul Fetniak from Oregon Health and Science University and Dr. Chris Salise from Towson University. Registration is open, so please visit the CERTUP and ESCCP webinar webpage uh, to register for this and other webinars through the beginning of 2023. Before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case we'd like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you can take uh, a quick moment to complete the short survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's uh, webcast. Thank you so much for your attention.